Welcome. Today we are talking about mental health and action. It's Mental Health Action Day in partnership with MTV and over a thousand other organizations. Today is the day that we are uh, working to spread the skills, the, the insights that help people take action for mental health, not just mental illness or brain illness, but actually health for all of us. And what does that even mean? There's so much stigma around this topic that even talking about how somebody who doesn't have a diagnosis, even just being able to say, oh, my mental health is a little compromised right now, uh, which I think for almost all of us it is, is a it's a challenging thing to say. And then what do we do? So today we are joined by a fantastic panel of uh, advocates and experts in this topic. And we are gonna be sharing some perspectives on what does it mean to be mentally healthy, to have positive mental health, and how do we bring that into our work with children and adults and ourselves to create a future where we can all be and do better. So I'd like to welcome the panelists in, and uh, we're going to start out with a question, which is uh, thinking about this context that we're in right now. Uh, 2020 and the first part of 2021 has had a lot of um, adversities towards mental health and well-being. And so I'd like you to introduce yourself and give us just one sentence. What's one way that you're working towards greater well-being in 2021? So, uh, Brianna, you want to go first? Yes. Uh, good day, everywhere, everyone, um, depending upon where you are joining from. Um, my name is Brianna Wolford. Some call me Bree. Either is fine. I am an educator, currently working at a charter school. I'm an assistant principal. I'm also a student, um, graduate of Spelman College, as well as Johns Hopkins University School of Education. And I'm currently enrolled at Teachers College at Columbia University um, in a summer principal's academy program. <laughs> I see you, Josh. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I'm very passionate about EQ as it relates to school communities. And um, one thing that I have done this year is a lot of work on my own self-awareness and identity. I'm a firm believer that in order for especially in the work that I do, for us to help children, families, and our community uh, be in better and more healthy, mentally, uh, mentally healthy spaces, we first have to do the work within ourselves. Thank you, Brianna. And uh, that work inside so that we can be leaders and supporters and allies is, it's a, it's a big work to do. And we'll come back to that theme. Uh, ben, how about you? Hi, hello everybody. I'm Ben Perks. I'm the head of uh, campaigns and advocacy at UNICEF Global Headquarters uh, here in New York. And I guess I would say that I'm trying to change the way the world um, talks about, thinks about, and acts on a whole range of things, including mental health and emotional well-being, prevention of uh, violence and trauma, response to humanitarian um, situations, uh, health, education, and of course, equity around the COVID uh, vaccine. So those are the main things I've been working on this year. Just some small, <laughs> small challenges, Ben. <laughs> like, <laughs> you just want to keep it simple in 2021. <laughs> Um, we'll come back to this, and uh, I'd love to have you share a little bit about uh, UNICEF's priorities in 2021 and, and why mental health is uh, an important part of all of that other work. Fio, let's go to you. Uh, intro and one thing you're doing to support well-being in 2021. Hi, everyone. My name is Fiorella Velarde, and I'm the Regional Network Director in Latin America. And I'm a coach, an educator, and a psychologist, and also a mom and a friend and someone very concerned about mental health. And I think that mental health prevention and awareness starts at the prenatal care. As someone that had um, 
survive postpartum depression and some other challenges, I think that we need to start as soon as possible. And in terms of supporting my mentoring, I focus on bringing them in. Mm. Can you hear me? Yeah, bringing them some tools and 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 be able to talk openly about this this subject. I think that's important, and I've been doing that openly with them throughout 2020 and this year. Thank you, Fio. Yeah, it's a hard topics to talk about, and when we want to get real, um, it takes a tremendous amount of courage. Raghu, would you introduce yourself and share one thing that you're doing to support well-being in 2021? Sure, um, pleasure to hear wonderful people a little bit late. The action day has been quite reflected deep for our own mental. One thing I'm trying to work in practice is stay open. Okay. We're having some we're having some echo, Raghu. I don't know if maybe your is this better? Your pods uh, are echoing. Or if you have the YouTube stream YouTube open in another window. <laughs> this is a frequent challenge as I had this happening earlier where I'd accidentally had the YouTube stream open in one window and the studio open in another window. So that sometimes does it. But let's okay, give let's uh, Raghu a second to reset there. Okay, let's try again. Great. All right. Hi, um, am I audible? Hi, everyone. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, AirPods connecting to all different Bluetooths. But um, what I what I wanted to say, and thank you for having me, Joshua, on this on this panel um, amongst so many amazing people. And um, this week in particular has emphasized one thing for me, and it's that yes, it's Mental Health Action Day, but those of us who are working in the mental health space are being stretched even more um, as the conversation increases which makes me um, commit to one thing, which is to really check in with my inner circle on a daily basis. And those are other people working in the mental health space, but also those that are very close to me and I love and care about. And I think sometimes we can get sucked into wanting to make very large macro level changes in the mental health space and well-being space in particular. But doing that, we can forget our own mental health and those around us. And so this year, I'm really committing to staying in tune with my inner circle alongside all of the other work that I do. And I know you spend a lot of hours in the hospital. <laughs> and you spend a lot of hours having very difficult conversations. And so I imagine that the conflating issues of health, economic injustice, social justice, Vaccine injustice. Uh, I know you operate a, a nonprofit that's working in India. And so I imagine there's just a lot of uh, rocks that are in your backpack right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, No, thank you for, for recognizing that. And it's, it's definitely true. And one of the most difficult challenges this year, I'll say, is that not only what's happening in India, but this past year with the pandemic was being a psychiatrist working in a, in a public hospital, in a county hospital and a private hospital, but particularly in the county hospital system and having the feeling of helplessness um, with patients because there's a lot of reactions and emotional reactions that they're having that are appropriate for the current state of the world and situation. But also at the same time, I felt like my hands were tied in what I could provide them for help other than to just be present and to listen and to be there as a consistent voice and person in their life. But it was very challenging and it brought me to some of my most difficult uh, points as well. Oh, thank you. So Ben, let's go to you expanding this uh, piece that Raghu's brought up, which are the, the uh, 
conflating effects of the multiple crises that we're facing, how, why is it that uh, mental health is one of the top priorities for UNICEF this year? And, and why should governments, businesses, organizations, family members, teachers, uh, psychiatrists, how should we be thinking about this right now in the face of the, the time that we're in and the pandemic? I apologize for some background noise. This is New York, so there's all kinds of noise going off outside. It's a, it's a great question. And I think that's what, what's happened is we've come to a point in history where the, uh, where the science has illuminated the importance of mental health, emotional well-being, uh, really for all life outcomes, the way it contributes and drives all life outcomes. We know now, for example, the way that early trauma in childhood is correlated with outcomes across almost every single well-being indicator. We know that learning is really dependent on, and decision-making is really dependent on on, uh, on emotional well-being. So th th this science has come together uh, across disciplines and really illuminated the importance uh, of mental health. And in that way, it's no different from the way that previous generations identified germ theory or piped water or immunization as being essential for human advancement and progress. And I think we're coming to the same point in uh, mental health. I think mental health has transitioned from something where we used to look at very obvious mental illness at the extreme end of the spectrum and consider that to be the sum total of everything about mental health. What we now realize is that everybody has got mental health. It uh, affects everybody. And the things that happen in our environment and our genes will, will, will affect uh, our mental health, um, health outcomes. I think also in addition to the science, really, really um, you know, illuminating the issue, we also have a cultural kind of revolution on this. I, I counted uh, in the Oscars, I think that a third of films had some kind of mental health storyline. If you look at the Booker shortlist of, uh, 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 for the book, the Booker Prize, most of the novels have some kind of mental health thread. And I think it's coming to the, it's very much coming to the scientific surface that's influencing policy but it's also coming to the cultural surface and that's influencing demand. And this is really good for human progress. I think often there's a view that mental health is getting much, much worse because it's talked about much more, but I think it's always been a problem. And some of the risk factors for poor mental health are getting worse, but some are improving. So I, I you know, I think there's a, it's, it's a long-term problem that we're just, oh, sorry, a long-term issue, because it's not a problem, a long-term issue that we're just, becoming aware of globally and making it policy relevant. Well, I love the metaphor of germ theory. And it's not that germ theory invented germs, right? People were getting sick from germs before we understood why they were, why that was important. And then learning that science opened up a whole new frontier of wellness and not just wellness in clinical care, but wellness in our everyday lives. So Brie, let's go to you and kind of from the macro to the micro, uh, Ben talked about this changes in society. You're having kindergarten, uh, it's not called graduation year school, but uh, kindergarten strive advancement, on. <laughs> strive yeah. on. Yes. Kindergarten strive on tomorrow. So what mm -hmm. are kindergartens? What is, what, tell us what does this have to do with kindergartners? <laughs> so um, to Ben's point about just talking and discussing the neuroscience behind trauma and how it is toxic and what it affects and how we function on a day to day. Um, also, just knowing how children don't have as much wisdom to make choices for themselves. Yes, they make choices. But as an adult, I can sense the feelings and what's going on and make a decision that I don't want to go to work today or I'm going to take the time off. Children have to show up to school and don't always have the vocabulary to describe what it is that they're going through. Um, it may come out in different ways, whether it's a tantrum or defiance or things are labeled that for some teachers, um, it takes a couple of years to understand how to address it in the classroom. 
and de-escalate it in an appropriate way that's restorative, that is um, a learning process that um, helps them gain the wisdom and the knowledge from what they're going through or what they're feeling, their emotions, that allows them to be better individuals. So um, on a school level, we here at this school, we try really, really hard to infuse that social emotional learning within the curriculum, within the day, having those check-ins. Um, I even have a, you can't see it, but I have a mood meter in my office. So when scholars come in, they may be going through something. We have, um, you know, what I feel right now and what I can do to feel X feeling. And sometimes it's okay just to sit in the feeling. Or if there's conflict, we have either restorative peer conversations or we have a restorative community circle in the classroom where we are able to talk about and articulate something that may have happened where otherwise um, they wouldn't have the opportunity to express themselves. And then they are forced to sit next to that scholar or that team member the next day as if nothing happened when they may have not had an opportunity to talk through it. Um, could be a misunderstanding, a, a, a lack of healthy communication, whatever the case may be. But um, I work with kindergarten through fourth graders. So as you can imagine, it's a very vulnerable time period where they have an opportunity to learn how to navigate their feelings and um, be smart with their emotions. Thanks, Bri. Um, this term mental health, uh, I see in the chat some comments coming up around this. Um, in many ways, the term mental health just became a substitute for people being uncomfortable saying mental illness. But unfortunately, I think a lot of times when people say mental health, they actually are just talking about illness or treating or the absence of illness, brain illness uh, and brain injury. Raghu, for you, what does mental health mean? It's a, it's a wonderful question and I appreciate you actually highlighting that because mental health to me is, a, it's a spectrum. Mental health is something that we all have. Every single individual has mental health. And I wanna emphasize that it's a spectrum because as the conversation increases around mental health, I've noticed a tendency of it to focus on encompassing wellness and stress and depression and anxiety, creating a larger gap actually on the mental health spectrum from those that are suffering from addiction and schizophrenia and bipolar and more what we call in the literature severe mental illness conditions. And we're not doing justice to the space. If we don't try to be inclusive, if we're gonna say mental health, we need to be inclusive of all of it. And that's very large and it's a spectrum and there's mental illness, which is when it starts to impair one's daily living and functionality and their quality of life. And there is poor mental health where you might not necessarily be at that severe state. But regardless of where you are on the spectrum, you can do something for your own mental health and well being. So to me, mental health is something that we all have. And we all also have a right to the resources we need to actually take care of our mental health. But mental illness is something that you know, is particular in that it does cause uh, some form of disability, whether it's functioning in a workplace or a school place or in your social life. And so we need to recognize that. And again, to emphasize, let's recognize that mental health is a spectrum. It's a large, large umbrella word that encompasses people of all kinds. So Fio, on one end of that spectrum is, um, a really deep level of challenge. Um, what's at the other end of the spectrum? Uh, well, Josh, first I wanted to add to what Brianna said about how we teach kids about emotions and the vocabulary, and also stress out that from this, this age, zero to seven years old, it's very important that kids co-regulate with their parents. So we do a lot of things teaching them and we have all these wonderful programs, but if we don't include parents in this education, if we don't bring them together into the conversation, it's, it's very challenging because they go back to the same environment and that gets reinforced. And guess what? They're going to model after their parents. So it's very important to bring them in the conversation as, and, and to answer to your question, 
and I love that you asked that question precisely because um, it's very close to me. I used to think that mental health was just being okay. And life was something that I have to carry on with. And I live like that for many years and quite not understanding why I was here. It's like, okay, well, this is something that has been given to me. What should I do with this, right? And But it's much more than that. Once you regain your mental health and you empower yourself and you know you can thrive, and that's the other side of the spectrum. But it's not just you thriving alone because you cannot thrive alone. It is a community of people. It is your surroundings thriving with you. There's no thriving alone. I mean, we all need each other. And even, you know, starting with raising children, we need a village. And what is happening is that we're growing more and more isolated. Now, we're opening the conversation and it might seem that everybody has these issues because now we're opening it up. And I think we all have at some level in this society with this dysfunctionality and the trauma in, in all different levels that we, you know, different people have experienced have some sort of this mental challenges. Ben, what do you make of that in from the perspective of, of UNICEF? I, I was looking at the World Health Organization definition of mental health. And they say it's not just about the absence of illness, but then the same webpage goes on to say the determinants of mental health are the absence of illness. Yeah. Uh, what is what is from UNICEF's perspective, or from your perspective, the the the, the thriving end of the spectrum about? Well, we have um, mental health. Quite rightly, the United Nations, the UNICEF, and WHO are part of the same United Nations uh, system, and we 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 see mental health as being on a spectrum. The way that physical health is on a spectrum, nobody asks if physical health is relevant to you. With mental health, what we're doing is trying to unlearn uh, a lot of the stigma, kind of one flew over the cuckoo's nest type of story that, that comes from a dim and dark past and trying to unlearn that. What we're really talking about, you know, sometimes it's called positive psychology, the idea that a human being can, can thrive, that they can have fabulous connections, that they have a good level of self-esteem, uh, that they are uh, able to, um, to to function in the workplace and the family and the community uh, and to, to, to basically thrive and to build a life that has a purpose where they are able to find a form of, uh, of happiness uh, and to feel good in themselves. Uh, to you know, I, I think that that's basically what we talk about when we talk about good mental health outcomes. The spectrum of uh, one of one of the, the the major drivers of negative uh, mental health outcomes is the absence of human connection. Fio, Fio talked about this a moment ago. When we think about trauma, one of the world's greatest uh, uh, psychology academics said trauma is basically the disruption of connection. So, so if we want to do things in terms of preventing poor mental health outcomes, promoting good mental health, we need to bring build societies, communities, schools, and families that promote deep connection where individuals and particularly children feel seen, safe, soothed, and uh, secure. Joshua, may, may I reflect on that? Please. So I, I I love what you're what you said, Ben, and I completely agree with you. And you know, I, I think two things that really strike me is that the word trauma is used a lot. And I want to emphasize to people that it's actually a very broad term. And when we think about trauma, traditionally people have thought about sexual or physical or, or emotional trauma, but it needs to be broadened and it needs to also be taken into different cultural contexts, because the way that trauma is historically treated has been modeled on Western culture. But the way that a lot of other cultures deal with trauma and intergenerational trauma does not necessarily benefit from those treatment ideals. So as we think about it, and I love what you say, you know, trauma is the disruption, right, or is the loneliness. And so I, I want to just stress that to people to think about trauma as something that's broad and it's really what it means for the individual and to meet them where they are culturally as well and what context they're coming from. And the second piece is 
we can cause the shift to happen, right? All we really need to do is all be advocates to say, hey, let's invest in early education that incorporates mental health literacy and toolkits for understanding emotion and building resilience over time. So when a child faces a disruption in their life or a stress or a trauma, or they recognize it in a peer or a colleague or a coworker or a loved one, they have a toolkit that they can come to. Well, this is a great time to make a plug for our project in partnership with UNICEF World Children's Day, which is called Pop-Up Festival. And Pop-Up Festival is an incredible uh, collection of playful, creative, fun activities that adults and children can use uh, together and to talk about emotions and to learn some of those tools. And there are a lot more tools needed, but some of those tools. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, UNICEF World Children's Day is November 20th. It's the day to celebrate the work that UNICEF does all year round. And so much of the work that UNICEF does is deeply painful. It's uh, particularly around children's rights. It's, it's we're fighting for uh, basic rights for children. It's dealing with what's happening to children in conflict zones and it's heartbreaking. This is the day to say it's also beautiful, joyful, uh, and we need to celebrate the progress. And yes, there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of work still to do. But on World Children's Day, it's a chance to celebrate that progress. And so Pop-Up Festival, over the last couple of years, we've had over 2 million children and adults in over 200 countries and territories celebrating emotions and children's rights and learning more of those tools and vocabulary. Uh, anyone want to share any more about that topic? Uh, well, I'd like to add that uh, the connection piece is so important. I was checking the numbers the other day, and in just in the United States, which is, by the way, by far the highest country with the rate of uh, mono monoparental homes. So we have 18 million people, 18 million homes, okay, where 15 million are just single, single moms, and the rest are single dads. So the majority are women, right? We don't have this support network. And it really, it's, if you already have, I mean, you're facing a mental challenge and you're a single parent, imagine what kind of challenge you have in your hands. And these goals, it's generational. You go, you pass it on to your kids and you go and it never ends. So it is like, we need to put, we need to invest the money in the interest to change this because it is, it's not changing just by wishing. And I, I really would like to see more action at the organizational level, at the workplace level, in the schools. And this is starts in the prenatal care. If, you, if, if This is something that you were not educated on. You didn't come with this education from your family. Well, your, your OBG has to be able to inform you that you have choices so, so you can start sort. Ben, I see you nodding your head. You want to add something here? Yeah, I think that's really important. I think that um, I, I agree with, with the colleague before that that uh, there are cultural specific, specificities to the um, the way that culture is addressed. But I sorry, the way that trauma is addressed. But I think the the the, the intergenerational trauma is something that is is a global issue. And I think one of the ways that we one of the most impactful ways that we address it is what Fiora has just said, is, is, to, is to engage in uh, the perinatal uh, phase to invest in early parenting. The way we can break the intergenerational cycle of, uh, of, of things like neglect and abuse and dysfunctional parenting, all of those things which are often unintentional, uh, the way that we can break that is if we can help uh, parents to become aware of three things of of child development needs so the, the way that the brain the emotional part all of that develops because parents don't know secondly to make parents self-aware of the way that sometimes without thinking about it their own history can impact their children but that's not necessarily the way it has to be and thirdly uh, helping uh, parents with practical problem solving and ways to uh, to build connection and uh, 
a deep attachment with their children. I think if we can, if we can, and it, this is very low cost and can be done in, a, in an evidence-based, affordable way globally in the same way that 40 years ago we introduced global vaccines. It's something that could be a real game changer for mental health all over the world. Um, yeah. So uh, you talked earlier before, Ben, about disconnection. Uh, I think Theo talked about loneliness. We know that uh, in the US Cigna study in 2020, we saw a massive increase in loneliness during the pandemic. We're seeing uh, loneliness as a, as a signal of disconnection. And I'm wondering, um, in this context where we have so much polarization, we have so much, mm, so many of those rocks that I referred to earlier in our backpacks, how do we support people to connect in a more meaningful way? Anyone want to take a shot at that? I could perhaps just very briefly, I think that, that I think that we need to uh, certainly think about schools uh, and, uh, and communities and think about connection as being a pub public good the same way that health services or education are a public good. So when we think about the way we run a school, the way we run a preschool, we have connection and belonging at the heart of that. Brianna, Brianna you want to add to that? Because I think that's your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. right there. Yes. Um, and Ben said something earlier and has emphasized like this idea of learning about the brain and neuroscience. I think um, before I get into like the day to day, but I think oftentimes it is left out of the conversation in schools when we're talking about SEL, social emotional learning. Um, students need to know what's happening in their brain too. They need to understand the, the, the connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and all of those things that trigger or send those signals um, to help us function and, and how kind of tell us how we respond to things. So um, I love the emphasis of that. And I think it's so vital and important to, yes, have a SEL curriculum, have some kind of framework, but do not forget the neuroscience that our babies as young as kindergarten can absolutely learn about. So they make sense of why this is so important. And, um, to Theo's point, start breaking down those generational um, stigmas around talking about feelings, mental wellness, and all of that. Um, and then, I'm sorry, Josh, repeat your question again. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> Ben was talking about schools as a place for connection to happen. Oh, yes. And, and really yes. centering uh, connectedness. And also, I think maybe equity comes in here. Mm-hmm. So I think that uh, more recently, I think it's so important to create spaces where staff members, teachers, um, and maybe even students can tell their story. And I think that level of connection around storytelling, around um, let me share something about me and perhaps find that window or that mirror where you are building that connection based on experiences. It's also going to help build empathy. It's going to help build not only uh, perhaps self-compassion, but also compassion for others. And it has to be prioritized. We can't be so caught up in the lesson plan and the scope, what we say we're going to do to teach our, our, our scholars, when quite frankly, if, if things feel heavy, um, sometimes we just need to have a conversation. And I'm thinking back to around the election and, you know, our school community did a great job of taking a pause or anytime something is happening in our world, take the pause. They won't be able to receive any kind of lesson or curriculum or content if they are not emotionally well and teachers will not be able to deliver that content if they also aren't emotionally well. So let's stop and have a conversation about what we're feeling and what we're going through and continue to normalize like this is a part of life. We are walking, breathing, living, living humans. So that's a part of it. And feelings is something that we can never like just ignore or or get away from. 
Raghu, I see you nodding. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm I'm loving this conversation, and I love that everyone is being so vulnerable and open about it. And um, I, <laughs> you know, something I do for my own mental health is this concept of Shinrin Yoku, which is uh, forest bathing, and not literally, be, you know, taking a bath in the forest, but the concept of being out in nature to to reground and create, come back to creativity, and. Uh, about a month ago, I was doing this and I thought of this concept of uh, micro contacts. And these are the things that I think we don't think about consciously, but over the last year, it's come to mind. And these are the contacts we have, the interactions we have with the barista when we get our coffee or we're in a bookstore and we talk to the salesperson or someone smiles at us when we're on the subway. And those things actually help us they help us feel connected. They help us feel grounded. It might not be a conscious thing that happens, but neurochemically and physiologically, we do actually react to that. And we do benefit from that. And this past year, we've lost a lot of that, whether it's because of the you know masks or being isolated, working from home. And so to start to emphasize the importance of micro contacts and to have everyone commit to just smiling or waving even to one another as things start to open up, there's a lot of social anxiety that's coming up. So let's really try to think about those micro contacts. One thing that I, I want to emphasize too, given the panelists here and the fact that we have people from you know all different sectors, is that we should start advocating for governments, even local governments in particular, to create larger community spaces, whether it be parks, whether it be outdoor coffee shops or benches whatever it is to facilitate contact that's not just digital, but offline. And not only does that help emphasize digital wellness for everyone who needs it, but it also helps to facilitate regular contact. It helps to promote a safe environment for contact as well. So I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. Um, I have been fascinated by this in the last year seeing how parking is being taken over. And I'm, I'm curious how many municipalities are going to now realize, oh, we actually don't need so many parking places. Having outdoor space for people is actually more valuable. Um, I just wanted to throw in here, in case uh, anybody hadn't seen it yet, we just published an article um, about um, the topics of today. And one of the things that is in this article over on the right-hand side is um, over 50 ideas like the ones we've been talking about, these micro things that we can do, like uh, taking a moment to do a dot to dot or five minutes of yoga or playing your guitar. The other piece that I wanted to share with you is this notion I saw in the chat, somebody's talking about we need more EQ coaches in schools. In the part of the spectrum that's around uh, brain illness, we know we need more clinical care and there's a shortage of clinical care in the world. On the community-based mental well-being side, the community-based mental health side, I think it's important for us to think about who are the professionals. You know, in the, in the realm of physical health, we have things like uh, gyms and fitness trainers and people who do, uh, you can go to if you want, you want help with your nutrition. And you don't need to go to the doctor, although you know, sometimes we need to go to the doctor. Who do we go to in this community-based space? And um, Ben, maybe we could come back to you. And in the work that UNICEF does, how do you approach the community-based part of, of mental health and health more generally. Um, I know there's a lot of that work in conflict zones. What happens after that? Um, Josh, would you mind if I just very briefly go back to your previous question and then come back to that one? Because I was kicking myself that I, I didn't say something and I really want to say it. James Baldwin, uh, and I just looked up the quote because it's brilliant. When you think about polarization and mental health, James Baldwin, um, wrote, who I think was a writer, an American writer that was very conscious of the mental health agenda before before many other people were, but he wrote, 
I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with the pain. And this is a key, uh, key issue of uh, unaddressed mental health unaddressed adverse childhood experiences, unaddressed trauma. It comes back to haunt us in Israel and the state of Palestine. It comes back to haunt us on January the 6th in Washington. Populists, organized crime, uh, crime radicalizers can identify at a hundred paces a young person in pain, recruit them and instrumentalize their anger and weaponize it uh, in a way that is extremely costly to that young person, to their family and their community and society at large. So it's not about the impact of polarization on mental health, but the impact of mental health on polarization. And if we intervene early, we can prevent a whole lot of pain later on. On to the point about community, we deal with, I don't know, the content of the continent of Africa. There are two mental health workers per 100,000 population on the continent of Africa, according to the World Health Organization. What, what we think about when we think about community engagement is primary prevention and promotion of mental health. Primary prevention is when you work with parents in the perinatal phase, as we talked about, and schools to promote, to create the best possible conditions for kids to be protected and to be, uh, to be connected and to, uh, to, to, to thrive and flourish. And then promotion is about creating communities that promote uh, mental, mental uh, health and emotional well-being, often using traditional uh, and cultural um, pathways for that. And this was something that Raghu mentioned earlier on. In humanitarian crisis, you know, you often see um, uh, trauma and poor mental health exacerbated by the trauma of conflict itself. So it's really important to reach out to parents and health workers in that environment and provide them with tools. We've just created some minimum standards for this in humanitarian context to, to create the tools for those families and, and key workers to be able to ensure in their inter interactions they are the responding to and supporting children who might be in stress. But this sector is massively underfunded. We think that mental health accounts for 30% of the non-fatal global disease burden, but less than 2% of health spending. So um, unless we have a massive global commitment to address this, it's very hard for us to, you know, really uh, to cover all of those in need. Theo, I want to come back to you in your region. Um, one of the things that has been such a joy working with you in Latin America is, you know, we have an event and people are hugging and kissing and they're together and there's like, the, I think Raghu talked about these micro interactions. Um, I just looked it up. We have an article on our website. I'll drop the link in the chat, which says that those casual social interactions are the number one predictor of longevity. Yeah. So, like what's happening for you now uh, as you're seeing people struggling with connectedness, how do we increase that connectedness in, in countries that are really struggling right now? Well, what I say, uh, that, that's a great question, uh, Josh, because uh, in my region is being very, very, um, I mean, they, they suffer this confinement and they still in some places confined and they, they, they cannot go back to any anything even similar to normal. And like you said, yes. I mean, the contact, the regular, the micro contact is very constant, okay? But also our societies have some layers of trauma. Uh, we have a societies that are highly elitist, where we have uh, spaces where racism and we have classism and all bunch of isms. So, the interactions are very polarized, if you wish, right now. COVID has brought the whole political aspect in the region. Uh, we're in election time in some countries. So I think COVID has not only affected people in the micro context, in their vitality, in their joy, because 
they really have to be confined. There's some days they cannot leave their homes, but also economically, their insecurity, their uncertainty. And I remember that when we did the state of the heart, the last state of the heart for Latin America, their main talents was were uh, race, race, race tolerance and resilience, okay? They were not too much into the planning, into the foresee in the future. They were just putting out fires all the time. And that resilience, it's actually, I mean, what's getting them through this crisis. But as the, as the isolation increases, people are starting to manifest more and more problems. So what we have coming right behind COVID is I think a whole, whole, I mean, crisis in mental health. Now in the Latin culture in several, I mean, it differs by country by country, but it's also a big stigma. I mean, you just don't go to a psychologist. And if you happen in some uh, sectors of society, certain demographics, to send your children to society, it is almost like you're sending your children to be fixed. You have no problems. You're sending your children to be fixed. And that's a mentality. So that's another challenge in itself. Raku, this is really connected with your work. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how do we get uh, more conversation happening about mental wellness in places where where that historically hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I love uh, this whole conversation that's happening right now. And I, I want to bring up the uh, the Harvard study that many people might know, which showed you know it followed a number of quote unquote crimson male undergraduate students over 80 years, and they showed that relationships and connection are the number one predictor of delaying mental and physical decline, more than IQ, more than wealth. So money doesn't buy happiness. You know, we know that. So it's really important to have this connection. And the work of the Minds Foundation, you know, we've been around since 2010. We started in 30 very rural villages in India, providing mental health education. And we've grown since then. But again, the number one predictor we see in healing and improvement is building connection and working with communities. So the way that we've been able to approach bringing up conversation, conversations around mental health in an area that where it was typically stigmatized at a very high rate is actually developing programs hand in hand, you know, bringing together key leaders, including teachers in particular, village leaders, community leaders, and also anyone who wanted to join in in the conversation and going in and just saying, you know, what are the issues you're facing? And from that, you derive effective programming and solutions. So it's really flipping the traditional, you know, NGO nonprofit landscape of, you know, we wrote this grant, we're going to try out this program and see what happens to let's actually take a human centered design approach and start with the conversation at the table and actually build a program with the community. And from that, you learn the best ways of bringing up conversations, right? It might not be bringing in a psychologist. It might actually be bringing in a traditional healer that the community trusts and then working with them side by side to deliver the information. So that's the approach that we've taken. And we found that to be very meaningful and very effective. And also it helps bring about allies that you might not have thought would support your work and the work that we are doing. So I think that as we think about a country, you know, like the United States, where we have so many different cultures and socioeconomic status levels, we have to think about working with each one of those subcultures too. And what is the best way to bring conversation and increase conversation? And the last point I'll make is that the one thing that we can all do, regardless of any of those factors, is to create a space where someone feels heard and if you can get them to a state where they're comfortable sharing their story, that's going to be the most powerful indicator of healing for the community that they're a part of, not just themselves. Hmm. There's so much to talk about here. Uh, I, would, I would think we could spend an hour just unpacking that last two sentences because the connection with, with racial, social justice, with gender inequity, with ageism, with classism, and how that um, makes this work of mental health and well-being um, more difficult. And I, I think, Ben, the point you raised earlier that our unaddressed mental health challenges 
um, then exacerbates, it comes and plays out in society in a way that perpetuates unhealthy contexts. Um, so we're gonna need to do another conversation soon. Um, we're coming up towards the end of our hour and Brie, I wanted to ask, is there a question you wanna uh, bring up as we, as our kind of last question for, uh, for today? Um, is there something else that you think we should talk about? Putting you on the spot. I, I know I didn't tell you I was gonna you ask you You are totally putting me on the spot, Josh. <laughs> um, but it's okay. I think in the position that I'm in as um, someone who is, in the field, in a school, on a day-to-day. -day. I guess my question um, to each of you is, what can those of us that are in schools, as well as um, other roles or um, in other careers that may not have a have access to the network or have access to certain things, what can we do on the ground um, to better educate ourselves in our communities in order to um, have a higher awareness around mental wellness and mental health? Well, the easy answer is to join six seconds, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> ben, ben, let's go to you. What, uh, in terms of advocacy and change in the world, what, what would you hope, uh, so Sabriana is a deputy principal. What would school leaders, uh, where yeah. could school leaders turn? I think that every um, teacher needs to understand that, um, that children who are loved and secure at home come to school to learn, and children that feel unloved, insecure, threatened at home come to school for safety and, and to be loved. And those are the children that have suffered the most in the COVID situation uh, because they've been cut off from those key relationships. This in a way is a personal story for me. I, you know, I, I grew up in, uh, in state care in children's homes and I was kind of rescued a little bit by a teacher that made that connection with me. So that has brought me now to my advocacy work for, um, for you know, for all schools to, 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 to really provide that connection for children because that is often the way they recover from mental health challenges at home and see a pathway to a better future. So, so just to make sure that kids in school are connected. I also think in the workplace in general, the workplace is a place where intergenerational pathways of trauma and distress and poor mental health can be disrupted by good connections where the person develops a sense of belonging and self-worth. You're on yeah, mute, Josh. Josh. <laughs> I've said something brilliant. <laughs> ben, thank you for sharing that. I think this gets right down to the essence of this work, that relationships are the foundation of our work, whether that's our clinical work, our educational work, our advocacy work, uh, our work in our lives. And if we can center those relationships and think of relationship not as a kind of sidebar to what we're doing, but as really the foundation, so something shifts in the way we put forward our time and energy. Raghu, how about you? Well, first of all, to Brianna, uh, thank you for the work you're doing. I know it's been a very difficult year for many teachers and educators. So the fact that you've been able to have some resilience on your own to get through all of it, you know, thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on the final question a little bit here, but what, <laughs> what you I'll can say, talk about anything you want. <laughs> what I'll say is that the one step that we can take to increase the conversation is to openly speak about our own experience and to be vulnerable, transparent, and honest about how we're feeling in the current state. And once we start to do that, we encourage others to do it. And I think that this is a key key, key lesson for those in, in, in positions of leadership, because traditionally there's a stereotype that as a leader, you do not show your emotions and your vulnerability, right? But just imagine if you had a leader or a supervisor who did, and it leaves room for you to start to express things and to have a dialogue back and forth about it and to start to support each other. Now imagine the workplace that could form and 
the 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 positive energy that's there and the willingness for people to come in and to work in that environment versus you know saying oh my gosh i can't i can't do this it's another monday right but to actually be excited about it and to transform so i just i encourage people to make a commitment to start to be open about how they're feeling and also to actually start to embrace the power of no if you start to feel overcommitted or stressed out this basic emotional literacy uh so many studies show that people use a, a, a very limited number of feeling words. And there are so many fascinating words. And just building up the vocabulary to be able to, to, to not just say fine. And um, for me, I um, have said this many times publicly, I used to be afraid of feelings. And I think sometimes I still am. But uh, they just seemed random. They seemed chaotic. They were really confusing. And so the study for me of being able to find all of these words to be able to understand what was going on for me and to know that that disappointment is different than frustration, is different than sorrow, is different than grief, is different than annoyance, <laughs> like in being able to find those words. Uh, and so I just, I love it when we can can learn those words and make it normal to have those conversations and help kids have those words. Sophia, what do you, what, what is your final word for today? Well, uh, thank you, Rago. I was reflecting on this call to authenticity, to be able to take the mask and, you know, with all the energy you need to sustain that and be able to redirect that energy into living to your fullest self and help others do the same. And it, it's, it's just, in, I mean, it touches my, my heart. And the other thing that I like to focus on, and I don't know if it's a question or a wish, it's to be able to open new spaces. How can we engage more people you know, from the companies, from the work, in workplaces to tackle on this issue, to give these benefits to these employees? How can we talk to more pediatricians, to more clinicians to spot this right away? I mean, to open more, because the educators are, are, you know, usual targets and they're working on this. We know that they're working on this. And, but we need to try to expand to new spaces, whatever we can, can be able to just get with this knowledge and, and try to, and try to help people understand that this is not just a personal issue. This is an, an environmental issue. This is a, a, a community issue. And so this goes back to this question of who is the workforce of that uh, community-based mental wellness. And my, one of my wishes is that we could have millions of EQ coaches out there in the world. And another one of my wishes is that we would empower more kids to be the EQ coaches for themselves and one another and helping kids really have tools for leadership in this space. Uh, I think I think they are an awesome workforce for supporting well-being in their communities. All right, brief. Uh, what are you taking away? Final thought? Yeah, I've I've heard a lot about building connections. I think it's even more important to be mindful of the psychological safety or the psychological safe spaces that we are building. Um, Josh always reminded by what you've said is when people uh, people resist or when you resist or people push away when you resist or something along the lines of like, there's got to be a safe space for individuals to even begin to have the conversation, begin to connect, begin to do the things um, that will help promote building um, their emotional vocabulary, having the words to describe how they're feeling and all of the work that will help us be a more mentally well world globally. And if we can all just commit to um, doing the work of deep listening and um, working on ourselves and understanding what we are feeling, feeling first, I think um, that's the work that we should begin with. Joshua, can I ask one quick question? So fire round. People can only say one word. What is your current emotional state? 
Brianna. Empowered. Uplifted. Inspired. Engaged. Excited. <laughs> well, what a fantastic ending question, Raghu. Thank yes. you. And um, I'm appreciative of uh, all of the brilliant work you're all doing in this space and um, Mental Health Action Day. Uh, let's all make sure we take one of those actions for ourselves. Being in this conversation with you all has certainly helped strengthen my emotional well-being today. And thank you all for joining. And um, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you.